This is the cardiovascular system dealing specifically with the heart. It's chapter 19. We divide the cardiovascular system up into several segments or parts, if you will. <clears throat> Excuse me, the blood, the blood vessels, and then the heart separately. So this will just be looking at the heart. We start off with the anatomy of the heart. Um, it's found, the heart itself is found in the pericardial cavity. It's surrounded by the pericardium, which is also sometimes called the pericardial sac. The superior surface, and this might sound a little bit backwards, but the superior surface is called the base. <clears throat> if you were to look at the location of it, it's about at the third coastal cartilage. And then the inferior surface or tip of the heart, where it kind of comes down to a point, is called the apex. And it's a little bit to the left of the sternum. So yes, your heart's pointed a little bit more towards the left. It's not in the, the dead center of the thoracic cavity. And it's between about the fourth and fifth ribs. Why is it important to know where the heart's located? Is Why am I getting so specific that yes, it's between the fourth and fifth ribs? That's important when you are practicing, <clears throat> especially if you need to listen to the heart sounds to know where to find the heart. And as we'll see, the heart has four chambers. And when you are listening, uh, usually you're listening to the lung sounds as well as the heart at the same time. You need to know where to put the end of that stethoscope so you know whether or not the sound you're hearing is it from the left side of the heart, the right side of the heart, which of the heart valves are you hearing. Um, so it's important to know the exact location. How big is the heart? Make a fist, and it's roughly the size of your fist. If you have an enlarged heart, uh, it's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, some people say athletes initially have a larger heart, but we're, we're talking an abnormally large heart, and the causes for that at this point in time are unknown. The heart is comprised mostly of cardiac muscle and it acts as a pump. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this diagram, you can see, if I put my pointer on here, uh, looking at the thoracic cavity, here's a sagittal view, but if we're looking right here, obviously your lungs, it's your right lung, your left lung, and then notice here's the base and then the apex. And it's pointed, as I said, a little bit more towards the left of center. If, if this is the midline right here, you can see um, it's not lined up exactly in the middle. <clears throat> there are four chambers to the heart. There are two atriums and two ventricles. And then we just divide it also by the left side and the right side. The atriums are the smaller of the chambers. They're on the superior portion, so on the top portion. They're the receiving chambers for the heart. The ventricles tend to be a little bit larger than the atrium, and they're the pumping chambers. So when the heart pumps, it's going to be moving blood out of the ventricles outside the heart to where it needs to go. And why I'm not specific about that is because there's actually what we call two circulation circuits or pathways. There's the pulmonary and the systemic. The pulmonary circulation is going to move blood uh, from the heart to the lungs and then from the lungs back to the heart. So it's just right next door, if you will. Why is it pumping blood to the lungs? That's for the gas exchange to occur. And then the systemic circulation is going to be pumping the blood to everywhere else in the body but the lungs. And when we talk about the chambers, the right side of the heart is involved with this pulmonary circulation and the left side with the systemic. So when we look at the pulmonary circulation, what's going to happen is the blood is going to leave the right ventricle. It's going to pass through the pulmonary semilunar semilunar valve. That is a valve that's between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. So that valve has to open up. The blood's going to leave from the right ventricle, pass through that valve into the pulmonary trunk, which in a moment we'll see a picture kind of sits right on top of the heart. And then the pulmonary trunk 
diameter wise it's thick but distance wise length it's not very long because it's immediately going to branch into the right and left pulmonary arteries the right pulmonary arteries go to the right lung the left pulmonary arteries will go to the left lung from there the blood is going to flow from the uh, pulmonary arteries <clears throat> they're going to branch smaller and smaller until eventually you get the pulmonary capillaries which are in the lungs that is where the exchange is going to occur where the blood as it leaves the heart going to the lungs is very high in carbon dioxide and very low in oxygen it's already been through the whole body so it's carbon dioxide is a waste product if it gets too high it's considered toxic so the body has to get rid of it that is what you exhale well how do you exhale it you've got to have the blood bring it to the lungs so you can exhale it and this exchange occurs in those pulmonary capillaries the the carbon dioxide leaves the blood goes into the air sacs and then the oxygen that you've inhaled moves into the blood in the capillaries from now the the blood that now is rich very rich in oxygen it's going to leave the lungs and go back to the heart how by the right and left pulmonary veins so the right pulmonary veins are bringing blood back from the right lung the left pulmonary veins are bringing blood back from the left lung <clears throat> the pulmonary veins will drain into the left atrium so that little circuit leaving the heart to the lungs back to the um, heart that is your pulmonary circulation the systemic circulation is when the blood's going to leave now the left ventricle. It's going to pass through the aortic semilunar valve. This is the valve that is between the ventricle and the aorta, <coughs> specifically the left ventricle. Excuse me. As the blood passes through the aorta, it's going to eventually um, well there are some larger branches immediately but it all starts branching think of like you're on a huge eight laned interstate and immediately you start having you know uh, you can catch a loop here and then two lanes go to the right and further up ahead there's going to be another exit to the right and oh there's a left exit it's kind of like that with the blood vessels the main station is the heart and as the blood leaves the heart you have this whole branching of the blood vessels so it leaves the heart for the systemic circulation initially with the aorta gradually as the branching occurs through the arteries then down to the arterioles which are even smaller uh, vessels it's like you're you're going from the eight lane to the four lane the arterioles now you're down on the two lane down to the capillaries now you're on the phone farm to market two lane dirt highway or country road whatever to the capillaries and the capillaries once again this is where the exchange occurs nutrient exchange the blood's going to be releasing the the glucose and the, all the various nutrients that are necessary for cell survival it's releasing the oxygen and it's picking up the carbon dioxide and then it's going the blood flows from the capillaries into the venules which are a little bit small, uh, larger in diameter, and then they get larger and larger, the veins, and finally the veins are all, now it's like you're heading back towards Houston. You're, you're going, you know, you're getting on the larger highway and the larger highway until you finally end up the major, um, from the entire body, the two major veins returning blood back to the heart are the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, and they both drain into the right atrium. And so <clears throat> this diagram down here, obviously here's your heart, the blood's um, arriving into excuse me, the, the right atrium to the right ventricle. Here it moves up, it's going to go to the lungs. The blue is showing that it is uh, low in carbon uh, in oxygen. The red is it's high in oxygen. So you have your exchange occur in the lungs and then that blood is returned to the left atrium goes to the left ventricle now it's going to go out the aorta this is a very simplistic uh, diagram but showing the systemic circulation
And in this enlarged version of the heart, you can see here is the inferior vena cava, here is the superior vena cava. Both of those, as I said, are draining the blood from the systemic circulation into, this is the right atrium, to the right ventricle. Out here, this is the pulmonary trunk. This is where it branches to the right pulmonary arteries. These are the left pulmonary arteries. So it goes to the lungs, comes back from the lungs. Here are the pulmonary, left pulmonary veins. Over here are your right pulmonary veins. Those all flow into the left uh, atrium, to the left ventricle. Out here is the aortic semilunar valve, up the aorta, and then it's going to go to the systemic circulation. When you look at the heart, there is um, what is known as the pericardium that surrounds the heart. It's composed of two layers. The fibrous pericardium is the outer layer. It's more dense. The serous pericardium is the inner layer. It's very delicate, and it can also be broken down into two smaller uh, components. The parietal pericardium, um, which is actually fused to the fibrous pericardium, and then the visceral or epicardium, uh, or epicardium, it could be either one. That's actually fused, the layer fused to the heart. So between these two components of the serous pericardium, that's where your serous fluid is. And the purpose of the serous fluid is to reduce friction. That heart is constantly pumping, so it's moving. Anytime you have something moving, you don't want things rubbing, two things rubbing together because that will generate friction which generates heat and it's more resistant and it just is harder on the heart. So if the serous fluid helps to reduce that friction. And this is just showing here is a, a cut section enlarged of the heart. So in here in a moment we'll talk about the different layers of the heart. This would be the inner lining of the heart. So this would be the actual chamber, open chamber here. This is a smooth endocardium. The myocardium is the muscle itself, the cardiac muscle. And then here you see that visceral layer or the epicardium. This is the cavity where the serous fluid is. Here is the parietal layer. So this right here is what comprises the serous pericardium. And then here is the fibrous uh, pericardium. And this is just another picture. I just thought it, it might help you to kind of visualize how um, you've got the cavity. If you're trying to say, well, why aren't these considered just completely separate components? Why do you have this kind of two components but of one layer? It's because it's connected up here, as you can see. The articles are extensions of the atrium. They, they look like these little flaps if, when you look at the surface features of the heart. And then the cell says these are grooves. There's usually fat around them. And that's where your coronary blood vessels typically will lie. The coronary blood vessels are those blood vessels, that, blood vessels if I can talk today, <clears throat> are the ones that are supplying the heart muscle itself. The heart muscle or cardiac muscle, it, it needs a good supply of blood, it needs nutrients, it needs oxygen. So it has to have its own blood vessels supplying its needs. Those blood vessels are often lying in these, these grooves in the celsus. There's three main ones. The coronary celsus is between the atrium and the ventricles. And then you have the anterior interventricular celsus, the name. Whenever you see this, don't panic when you first see this name and go, oh my goodness, what ugh, another huge word. I'm never going to learn all this. A, take a deep breath. Break the words down. I just told you a celsus is a groove. And you've seen that with the brain too. So that's a groove. Interventricular. Inter means between the two ventricles. So don't be looking up at the top where the atriums are. Look lower down where the ventricles are and find the groove that is between the right and the left ventricle. And if it's anterior, it's on the front of the heart. If posterior, it's on the back of the heart. 
So I know there's a lot of vocabulary, but just, just try to break it down. So if we look at this diagram on the heart, I know there's a lot of stuff on here, and I'm going to have the same picture throughout because we're we'll pointing out different things. But looking at the surface features that we just mentioned, the auricles, these little flaps. When you do a heart dissection, you kind of notice they, they look like these little well, flaps, these little extra pieces on top. They're actually part of the atrium. And then the coronary salsus is this groove that's here, and you can see it especially well on the back view. See where those blood vessels are? They're lying in that coronary salsus right here. And then you've got the anterior inter, um, ventricular salsus with some of these blood vessels in them, the major ones. And then on the back side, the posterior interventricular salsus is this one right here. When we look at the cardiac muscle itself, there's three different layers of them. The endocardium, myocardium, and the epicardium. Once again, break the words down. Cardium refers to heart. You've already seen endo and epi. Now, myo refers to muscle. So let's piece it together. Endo, by this point in time, you should be familiar. That's always going to be the most interior. And indeed it is. That's the layer that is lining those chambers that covers the heart valves. The epicardium is the outermost layer. We've already talked about that one when we were talking about the pericardium. So the myocardium, it's the middle layer. It's the cardiac muscle cell it's itself. It's the thickest layer. layer. Um, we'll see in a moment there's the way the muscle, the way the fibers go. It's, it's very logical. It's complex, but it's very logically put together to get the most efficient pumping possible. And another thing that you will notice is that the left ventricle is thicker than the right ventricle. And why is that? Because the left side of the heart has to pump the blood to the entire body. The right side, the right ventricle, only has to go right next door to the lungs. You know, it's like walking to the apartment next door to you. It's just right there. But the left side has to go everywhere. It's got to get that blood all the way down to your toes and back. So it has to be much stronger. And you, this is very easily seen if you do a heart dissection, if you view some of the videos that we have of heart dissections. The other thing is uh, a lot of you may be hunters, and this is fairly true with a lot of animals. So, you know, if you got that nice uh, buck, you got, um, I don't know, a wild hog, you were able to go somewhere and get an elk, you know, or even, you know, if you go to have a, you have a whole chicken or you get a turkey and you pull up, next time you do that, take the heart, slice it in half, look at it. And you can see that the left side, the muscle is significantly thicker than the right side. Now the Myocardium, the muscle, as I said, has this complex pattern. It kind of looks like a circle line. That's how it's often described. And the way it wraps around. And comes. Now, notice how the fibers are going. Think about how efficient this would be as a pump when these muscles, and they, all these cells are going to contract in unison. Um, so the top portion is going to contract, then the bottom portion contracts. It's much more efficient, especially down here at the bottom uh, where the ventricles are. When all of this contracts to be able to force that blood out, it's much more efficient than if it was just all, say, linear or all horizontal. Notice when this cross section of the heart with the ventricles, when it's relaxed, the it looks like the chamber on the right side is larger than the left side. The amount of volume of blood it's going to be pumping is about the same. But notice right here how much thicker the muscle is. And when it contracts, how much thicker it is. Um, 
to allow once again that force of pumping that blood all the way it's got to go this is the order right here it's got to go up and some of it's going to go off this way towards the upper part of the body then it goes around the back side and will it's got to go, literally go all the way to your toes and back if we look at the internal structures of the heart there's the interatrial septum once again break the words down You've never seen this before and you're thinking, I don't know what the heck that is. Okay, interatrial. It's between the atriums. It separates, that is the septum, that is the, the part that is separating the right atrium from the left atrium. The interventricular septum, that's going to separate the right ventricle from the left ventricle. And then it's very thick because you've got so much increased pressure there. The atrial ventricular valves. Those are going to be the valves between the atrium and the ventricles. And they are going to open and close at different points in the cardiac cycle, the pumping cycle. It will regulate the blood flowing from the atriums down to the ventricles. The AV valve, which is they're often abbreviated as the AV valves, specifically the tricuspid is the one that is between the right atrium and the uh, right ventricle. The bicuspid, which is also been known as the mitral valve, is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. There are also the semilunar valves. There's two of these. There is the pulmonary semilunar valve, which is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. And then the aortic semilunar valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. So they're going to control the um, blood flow going from the ventricles out to those receiving arteries. So in this diagram, if we look at it, let's point out a few things here. <coughs> Excuse me. Here is the interventricular septum dividing the two ventricles. You can't really see because of the pulmonary trunk, trunk but behind here would be the intraatrial septum. This is the right atrium the right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. So if we look at the valves right here, between the right atrium and the right ventricle, this is the tricuspid valve right here. It has three little flaps to it. Here is the pulmonary semilunar valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. Over here is your left ventricle and your left, excuse me, left atrium, left ventricle. And right here is the bicuspid or mitral valve. There's two flaps. And then right up here, in this little corner here, is the aortic semilunar valve, regulating flow from the left ventricle out into the atrium. So the right atrium is receiving blood from three different components. It's going to receive blood from the superior vena cava, which is draining blood from everything above the diaphragm. The inferior vena cava is, is bringing all the blood from below the diaphragm back to the heart. And then the coronary sinus, this is bringing blood from the heart muscle itself, that blood supply to the heart itself, not in the chambers of the heart, but supplying the cardiac muscle itself. It is going to be returned to the heart uh, via the coronary sinus. So all three of those will drain into the right atrium. The blood passes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Now there are on the valve the flaps. The tricuspid has three flaps. So these flaps have to be attached to something so they're just not flapping all over the place. How do you control it? Well, you have what are known as the cordae tendon. And these are attached to the flaps and the other end is attached to the papillary muscles. There's three of these. These muscles, these papillary muscles are little extensions from the wall of the ventricle and it helps to position those valve flaps correctly so that you don't want them to move back up into the atrium the whole purpose of having these valves is to prevent blood from backflowing. Once it goes into the ventricle, you want it to stay there. So at a certain point, they're going to close. Well, you don't want the flaps um, 
going too far up into the atrium. So the chordae tendons are going to help control that. The right ventricle is going to pump the blood to the lungs for this gas exchange to occur. And this is a picture of a heart, which is really cool here, um, that you can see. Actually, these little cord, the chordae tendons, they look like these little thin strands of thread is what they look like. And you can see this once again. If you have the opportunity to um, see a heart, whether you're a hunter or even if um, you have a, like I say, you buy a whole chicken or a turkey. My kids, okay, the disadvantage of having a mother as a biology instructor is ever since my kids were little, whenever I'd cook a turkey or, you know, have a whole chicken and we'd pull out all the um, innards, as I call them, you know, and we look at the liver and, and we would take the heart and we cut it up and, and they're just used to seeing that. Um, but it's really kind of cool. It actually, you People often think, oh, you can't really see this. Yes, you can. They look like little, it looks like little white piece, you know, strands of thread. And then they're attached to the papillary muscle. And then this trabecula here, this are ridges in the, the wall that allows it to kind of expand and to hold the, the blood better. Um, but these are really, really cool. Yes, I know I'm a science nerd. The left atrium receives the blood from the right and left pulmonary veins. There's two right pulmonary veins and two left pulmonary veins, so it's got those four veins uh, draining the blood into the left atrium. That blood is returning from the lungs, so it's going to be highly oxygenated, meaning it has a very high concentration of oxygen and very, very low carbon dioxide. The blood's going to go through that bicuspid or mitral valve into the left ventricle. The left ventricle, as we said, has very thick muscular walls because it's got to pump uh, that blood all the way through the entire systemic circulation. So it's got to have a lot of force to do that. Now, the bicuspid, as the name implies, bi means it has two flaps. <coughs> so therefore, there's only two papillary muscles uh, with the chordae tending. Right ventricle had three. Why? It's the tricuspid. See how the names start to, um, cusp means like a flap. So tricuspid means you have three flaps. Bicuspid, you only have two. Those heart valves, as I said earlier, help to prevent backflow. The AV valves uh, regulate that flow from the atrium to the ventricle. So tricuspid between, on the right side, bicuspid or mitral on the left side. And then the semilunar valves is preventing uh, blood flowing back uh, from the arteries back into the, the ventricles. Pulmonary <coughs> is going to be between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, and the aortic semilunar is between the left ventricle and the aorta. <coughs> so once again, and I know I keep going over this, but I want you to understand fully. Here's the superior vena cava. Here's the inferior vena cava. And it's it's not showing you the coronary signs, but it's it's flowing in from the back. The, the way they have this cut, you can't see where it comes in. But here is the right atrium. So it's receiving that blood through the tricuspid valve. And just kind of a hint, if I keep going over this multiple times and you're thinking, okay, we got it. Well, if I'm going over it through multiple times, that means, <laughs> hint, 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 you need to know this. By the time a test comes around, you should be very familiar with this picture and be able to label everything. So superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coming into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve. And it's showing the chordae tendae here that are attaching it to the papillary muscles. You're in the right ventricle right now, through the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary trunk, where it branches now, the left pulmonary artery, the right pulmonary artery, 
The blood gets oxygenated in the lungs, comes back, returns to the heart by the left pulmonary veins or the right pulmonary veins, returns to the left atrium, goes through the bicuspid or mitral valve. Notice there's only two chordae tendae uh, papillary muscles with those chordae tendae attached into the left ventricle. And once again, the wall is so much thicker on the left ventricle. Here, look at that interventricular septum, how thick it is. The blood's going to then go through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta to the rest of the body. And this, uh, this is a really kind of a cool picture showing the valves themselves. So you've got your pulmonary valve, the aortic valve. These are semilunar valves. And then the AV valves, the tricuspid. And notice here, yes, yeah, see how it gets its name? And then the bicuspid. And this one I thought was kind of cool because it shows with the uh, semilunar valves being open and the AV valves being closed. And you can see right here how the aortic valve right here is open. So it, the mitral valve is closed, so it would prevent blood from going flowing back from the ventricle back up to the atrium because right now you want it. It's like, no, don't go this way. We want you to go up here through the aorta and then out. The coronary circulation, this is um, the specialized system that's just to feed the cardiac muscle itself with the nutrients, the oxygen removes the waste products from it. The coronary arteries are going to branch off from the aorta. The left coronary artery um, and the right coronary artery are the, the two major coronary arteries. And the names tell you kind of how they're going, what direction they're going to go. The left coronary artery, the circumflex, branches off and sits in that coronary salsus. Remember that is the, the salsus, that's the groove. And the coronary one is the one that kind of separates the atrium and the ventricle. So the circumflex branches off from the left coronary artery, and then also you have the anterior interventricular artery. And then the right coronary artery will branch into the marginal arteries. So you'll see here, um, the here's your aorta. So on the surface here, you see how you've got your, here's your left coronary artery, here's your right coronary artery that branch off from the aorta itself. And then, You've got your branching down here into the marginal arteries. So this is coming down, wrapping around the right side of the heart, around the right ventricle. And then over here, the left coronary artery, this circumflex artery will continue around on the coronary salsus, but you also have the branches coming down here as well, such as your anterior interventricular artery. And if you look at the posterior, the back view of the heart, here comes that circumflex artery that came around this way. Here it comes wrapping around here. The right coronary artery goes around this way. And then you have, once again, the uh, marginal arteries branching off from the circumflex. The posterior cardiac vein, small cardiac vein, and middle cardiac vein will drain into what's known as the great cardiac vein. The great cardiac vein then drains into the coronary sinus, which then drains into the right atrium. The anterior cardiac veins will drain directly into the right atrium as well. So there's two different types of cardiac muscle cells. There's the myocardial contractile cells. The majority of the cells are this particular type. They're able to conduct impulses and they're able to contract. And then you've got your myocardial conducting cells. These form the conduction system of the heart. So they're going to be the ones that are going to start or initiate the action potential and propagate it. Cardiac muscle has if you look at the cellular structure of it, they're very short. They're striations. There's a lot of branching with them. There's very little calcium stored in the cell. So that's a difference from what, from what you saw with skeletal muscle, where skeletal muscle does store calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Cardiac muscle does not. 
And so where does it get calcium for muscle contraction that's necessary for it to occur? It has to come from extracellular sources. Because it's having to move the calcium from outside the cell inside to the cell, that's going to slow down the onset of contraction. It's going to slow it down a little bit if you look at the timing of it as compared to skeletal muscle. Intercalated disc are seen with cardiac muscle. They're unique to the cardiac muscle. It's a connection between adjacent cells. When you look at a slide, the histology of it, they look like um, lines. Um, the purpose of it is that because it does connect adjacent cells, it helps to hold them very tightly together when the muscle contracts, and it allows for a very uh, synchronized form of contraction. So, as I said, the cardiac muscle, it's branching, it's striated. Uh, you can kind of see a little bit of these little lines that, um, right here, they're going to go across the vessel at a 90 degree angle. And those are your inter intercalated discs. There's one right here, there's one right there, there's one there. Um, looks like there's one down there, there's one right there. And this is what it shows, <clears throat> how it helps with these gap junctions to allow things to pass through from one cell to another. But they're also, the desmosomes are holding them very tightly together. So when that muscle contracts very strongly, you, you don't want, say, this cell, right, this is one cell right here. You don't want it kind of being pulled this way and that one being pulled this way. <coughs> you want them all to be held tightly together. So the conduction system of the heart, um, the nervous system is not going to be generating the electrical impulse like what you saw with muscle cells. Instead, the heart is um, able to generate its own electrical impulse by itself. Now, the rate, whether it's going fast or slow, needs to speed up or slow down, that can be influenced by the nervous system and that can be influenced by hormones. But the generation of it, the starting of the electrical impulse, is still going to be generated by the heart conducting cells themselves. The components of the conduction system are composed of these parts. The sinoatrial node, the atrioventricular node, the atrioventricular bundle, the atrioventricular bundle branches, and the Purkinje fiber cells. So where are these and what does it mean? The sinoatrial node, which is often abbreviated as SA node, it, this is located in the superior and posterior wall of the right atrium. Know your directional terms. So that means it's in the upper back wall of the right atrium. These are your pacemaker cells. Whenever you hear somebody talking about pacemaker cells, these cells of the SA node are your pacemaker cells. So they are responsible for generating that impulse and maintaining that what we call sinus rhythm, that normal rhythm of the heart. If you've ever wondered what it means if you're watching some medical show, and it, do we have sinus rhythm? That just means normal rhythm. The impulse, when it generates this electrical impulse, impulse is going to travel from that SA node to the atrial ventricular node. This results in the contraction of the atrium. There's going to be a slight delay before the impulse is sent to the atrial ventricular bundle. Why is there this de delay? It's a Everything is set up for the most efficient way of pumping. You're going to have to pump the blood from the atrium to the ventricles. Well, when the atriums are contracting, you don't want the ventricles contracting. You want them relaxed so that they can receive all of that blood. You don't want to pump the blood out of the ventricles as soon as it gets there from the atriums. So what happens is the atrium pump, the ventricles pump, atrium pump, ventricle pump, atrium pump, ventricle pump. It has to be very synchronized and very timed. So if you're sending this impulse from the SA node down to the atrial ventricular node, that's how you get the contraction of the atrium. You don't want the ventricles to contract right away. So that slight delay is going to keep the ventricle 
on its own. Uh, basically, delayed timing is compared to the atriums. The atrium ventricular bundle, also previously known as the bundle of Hiss, this travels down through the interventricular septum, and then it's going to branch into a right and a left bundle branches. The atrioventricular bundle branches reach the heart apex, where then they connect with your Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers are the ones now that are going to spread that impulse that was initially generated by the SA node, it's going to send it to the myocardial contractile cells of the ventricles. Now you start to get the ventricle contraction, which is going to begin at the apex. So, <coughs> excuse me. right up here, remember we said it's in the superior posterior wall of the right atrium, is your SA node. It generates that impulse. Where does it send it? Here we go. It's going down through the uh, these nodes here and it's spreading throughout the right atrium, also now being sent over here to the left atrium. And then right here is your atrium ventricular node. A little bit of a delay as it goes through the atrial or the bundle of his. And now it's going to branch. You've got your right bundle branch. You've got your left bundle branch. Now you hit down here at the apex, and it's going to go and continue up the outer walls. These smaller fibers here are your Purkinje fibers. So because the impulse is going here, atriums contract, slight delay. Your contraction is going to start here at the apex and move up for the ventricle. And that's what this diagram is showing. <coughs> it's here at the heart's at rest. Here comes the impulse from the SA node. Atriums are contracting. Stimulates the AV node. Here comes the bundle of his down the bundle branches. Now you stimulate Purkinje fibers. You've got contraction of the ventricles occurring. And then they're going to relax. And then you start over. So once again. Atrium, ventricle, atrium, ventricle. And this is another diagram I thought would be helpful for you to see how you can relate. You can talk about the heart contracting, but you can relate it to looking at the pattern on a um, EKG, electrocardiogram, which is measuring the heart rate. So <clears throat> here's your SA node right here. Once again, it's being stimulated. And right here, this is the P wave. And you notice, what does the P wave correspond to? It corresponds to the contraction of the atrium. And then, now the atrium is relaxing, in this little segment right here. Here's your AV node. It's now was stimulated, because here is your SA node. Stimulate, move contractions. Starting, you stimulate the AV node, bundle of Hiss, branching, and Purkinje fibers. <clears throat> so right here, this is the QRS wave. That's highlight the entire thing's highlighted right here, and that corresponds to now when the ventricle is contracting. So atria contract, atria relax, ventricle contract, and over here you can have ventricle relaxing at the end. But it's helping you to piece it all together. So the cardiac cycle, this is the time period that it takes. It's going to start with the atrium contracting, and it's going to end with the ventricles relaxing. Systole is contraction. Diastole is relaxation. So when you talk about systolic pressure versus diastolic pressure, you're comparing the contraction versus the relaxation. Blood's going to flow down a pressure gradient. It's always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure, as most things will. So initially, all the chambers are relaxed, as we saw in that previous picture. Your AV valves are open. Your semilunar valves are closed. That is going to allow blood flowing into the atriums 
And if the AV valves are open, then that means it's going to continue flowing down into the ventricles. Is it flowing out of the ventricles? No, because the semilunar valves are closed. When the atrium contracts, that's when you have your P wave. Then your atriums relax. The ventricles start to contract. That's going to close the AV valve so the blood doesn't flow back into the atrium. And it's going to also at the same time open the semilunar valves, which now allows us the ventricles to contract, to pump that blood out of the ventricles through the semilunar valves. This is the QRS complex. And then when the ventricle finally relaxes, that's the T wave, the semilunar valves now close, and the AV valves are going to open again. So you've got your blood flowing in. Notice it's showing with the, all the valves open. And then over here, <coughs> the semilunar valves close. You've got the atrium starting to contract. That's going to trigger the closing now of the um, AV valves. Initially, right here for a short time, is that all the valves are closed. Then as that pressure builds up and the ventricles contract, that triggers these uh, semilunar valves to open, forcing the blood now out. The AV valves are closed to prevent backflow. Uh, once you've pumped the blood out, the semilunar valves are going to close to prevent backflow from the arteries coming back in. And then right now, for a short time period, all the valves are closed. Now they're, uh, it's going to open. The semilunar valves remain closed. Here come the blood through again. And once again, you can see here and relate with the EKG what is happening. Once again, the P is with the atrium contracting. And now the um, QRS is when the ventricles contract, and now you're returning back to relaxation. Different people see things differently. So this is just showing the one cardiac cycle, and it is showing both for the ventricles and the atrium of, remember, uh, systole is the contraction. Uh, so when do you have atrial um, systole, ventricle systole, so over here, who's contracting, who's relaxing, when. In terms of the sounds that you hear, um, there can actually be up to five different sounds if there's problems, which hopefully you don't hear all that. Uh, there's two main sounds, and people usually refer to it as a love dub, love dub. First sound, that is the closing of the AV valves. That's when the ventricles are contracting. The second sound is typically referred to as a dub sound, which is the closing of the semilunar valves. Um, so that's why at the beginning I was like, it's important to know exactly the location of the heart so you know where to listen with the stethoscope so you know whether you are hearing. Um, the sounds are kind of distinctive, but even still, you, you want to be able to hear the valves. If there is a murmur, a heart murmur, it's a little unusual sound, um, and it's usually due to valve defects that you can hear. Maybe they're not quite closing completely and there's a little bit of blood backflowing. You can kind of hear a whooshing sound. Um, a lot of people, as they get older, will develop very small, minor heart murmurs. Certainly in a young person, it's something that wants to be checked into. Um, just to be careful with it. Um, and one thing that's often recommended, especially as you're older, if you are diagnosed with a heart murmur, um, because, like I said, the valves often, they're just not as flexible when you get older. It's just part of aging. Um, the one thing that a lot of people will recommend is that if you are diagnosed with a heart murmur. Um, 
And like I said, this can be just an effect of aging. Sometimes if you have a heart murmur, it can put you at a little bit higher risk for certain uh, potential infections um, with certain bacteria, et cetera, that, that tend to want to migrate towards the heart valve. For this reason, you have a lot of bacteria in your mouth. It is usually recommended if you have, certainly if you have a significant heart murmur, that prior to having any type of dental work done, even just visiting your dentist, uh, is to let them know that you have a heart murmur. I know personally for me, several years ago, um, they found that I had a, a, I have a very slight heart murmur. And so um, when I told my dentist, they always prescribe, I have to take an antibiotic an hour before I go, even just for a cleaning. They just don't want to take a chance that in the cleaning process, um, if, say, in cleaning your teeth, you happen to, you're scraping off plaque, which is bacteria, uh, or form from bacteria, that um, there might be a chance of getting an infection. So that it's just a precaution, just something to be aware of. Um, so if you have a stethoscope at home, you know, just listen to the heart. Um, I will say it was interesting, one of my recent visits for just a checkup, and my doctor was a little surprised listening to my heart, knowing that I have a heart murmur, so he's trying to hear, is it, you know, a little bit worse, how is it doing, and then he got a really funny look on his face, because the timing of it was just as he was listening for the second sound, um, and he's obviously got his stethoscope on. We'll just say it was afternoon and I hadn't had lunch and I was a little hungry and my stomach started growling. Just perfect timing and all of a sudden he got a funny look and he's like, that sound was not right. It was I'm like, that was also besides my heart, that was also my stomach growling. So you may hear extra noises sometimes. Cardiac physiology. Now some of this... I'm going over fairly simplified. Um, certainly, if you end up working uh, with cardiac patients, this is something that you're going to want to be very careful of measuring. And it's kind of one of those things you get very familiar with it on the job training, if you will. So, just in general, CO refers to cardiac output, and that's the amount of blood that each ventricle will be pumping in one minute. The stroke volume is the amount of pump, blood pumped by each ventricle. And the heart rate is how many beats per minute. So you can calculate cardiac output by multiplying stroke volume times the heart rate. Now what are different things that can affect the heart rate? And this is where the nerves can play a role, your autonomic nervous system. If you're scared, if you're stressed, that's going to go up. If you're very relaxed, it's going to hopefully calm down a bit. Hormones can play uh, a role in your heart. What's your fitness level? What's your age? All of these play a role in what is your heart rate going to be. Factors that it can affect the stroke volume, well, the size of your heart. Once again, fitness levels, your gender, contractility, the duration of the contraction, the preload, and the afterload. Afterload is resistance. So you have all these different um, factors that will affect the stroke volume. In healthy individuals, the heart rate and the stroke volume tend to increase during exercise for most people. Cardiac output then is going to increase. That increases the heart efficiency. Um, it's real important that you know just personally for you what's normal for you because, um, like I say, normally the stroke volume and heart rate will increase during exercise for most people. Um, but just, just know what's what's normal for you. Personally, for me, my heart rate goes down when I exercise and my blood pressure goes down. So uh, it's just something that I, with my cardiologist, have learned that um, 
I can't use it as an excuse not to exercise, so I'd like to, but I just, I have to be very much aware. I know the signs to look for, for me, in terms of how I feel. I can tell when my blood pressure is dropping. I can tell if my heart rate's going high or low. Um, I can just kind of sense it and feel it, and I know, ooh, I need to stop and sit down before I pass out. Newborns, their heart rate is typically higher than adults, and it tends to decrease as you're growing up into young adulthood. And then as you get older, it's going to start to get high again. A resting adult typically is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. If it is lower than 60, that is referred to as bradycardia, bradycardia if I can speak. Um, and then tachycardia is if it is greater than 100 beats per minute. Once again, you need to know what your own personal heart rate is, so what's normal for you. Um, I have a daughter who is um, very healthy, in shape, young. She's in her mid-20s. Her resting heart rate is probably about 105 beats per minute. Hers has always been high. What are some factors that will play a role in increasing the heart rate, which in turn increases the force of contraction? Uh, things like the hormone norepinephrine, that's released uh, by the sympathetic nervous division. Um, some of your proprioceptors, chemoreceptors, decreased levels of uh, oxygen. Uh, increased levels of CO2, that is going to increase your heart rate because that's going to be a huge stimulus to get you to increase your breathing rate. Not so much low levels of oxygen, but the increased levels of CO2. Like, oh, we need to get more oxygen in here. Um, and it shows some of the different ions, etc. cetera. Uh, nicotine, caffeine. Those are both stimulants that's going to increase the heart rate. And then factors that will decrease uh, the heart rate, like a decrease in body temperature. The stroke volume, we talk about preload and afterload. Preload is the end diastolic volume. That's the amount of blood that's going to be in the ventricles at the end of the atriosystole, just prior to ventricular contraction. So just before the ventricles contract, how much blood is in the ventricles? After load is the force that the ventricles must develop to efficiently pump the blood against the resistance in the vessels, because the vessels are going to have some resistance. So you have all these different factors that can play roles with affecting the stroke volume, either increasing or decreasing, and factors that affect the heart rate over here in yellow, and once again, all that's going to play a role with the cardiac output. So in terms of the heart, once again, here we go. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava in the coronary celsus, which once again is not shown. Those flow into the right atrium right here. Um, the fossa ovalis, this is a remnant left over um, from fetal development, which we'll talk about with some of the blood vessels later. But just so you know, um, during fetal development, prior to birth, there's a shunt, basically. There's an opening between the right and left atrium that allows blood essentially to bypass the lungs because the fetus isn't using the lungs, it's getting oxygen from the mother. And so there's this bypass here. At birth, there's this uh, kind of like a flap that's going to seal up, but the remnants of it are known as the fossa ovalis. That is what this is. Uh, sometimes when you hear about an infant being born with a hole in their heart, sometimes it's this area right here is not sealed properly. When the baby takes its first breath, this will seal up. Um, so if you're wondering what that is, that's what that's from. So once again, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, 
and you don't see the coronary salsas. They're all flowing into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve. You see the chordae tendae, which are helping to hold those flaps in place, and that also involves the papillary muscles. The blood flows into the right ventricle. It's going to flow through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. Up oh, here's your branch to the left pulmonary artery and goes under the aorta and comes out over here. It's the right pulmonary artery to the lungs where gas exchange occurs. Comes back highly oxygenated. That blood coming in on the right side was very low on oxygen, high on CO2. So now it's coming back from the lungs by the right pulmonary veins here and the left pulmonary veins over here. All of those are flowing into the left atrium. Nicely oxygenated blood. It's going to go through the bicuspid or mitral valve. Here are your chordae tendons holding it or attached to the papillary muscles, of which there's two here. Filling up the left ventricle. And then it will go through the aortic valve up here to the aorta and then around to the rest of the body. That separation right here is the interventricular septum. The endocardium is the lining of the chambers in the heart valves. The myocardium is the muscle itself, and the epicardium is this outer layer of the heart here. I think we have covered everything on there. Um, sometimes knowing too much can be a little bit of a problem. Um, just knowing that, you know, the right side of the heart is going to be pumping to the lungs and the left side pumps to the rest of the body. The atriums are the receiving chambers, the ventricles are the pumping chambers. Years ago when I was in graduate school, uh, I was in northern Idaho, so I went to school at University of Idaho and my uncle and aunt lived fairly close, and my uncle likes to hunt, and I would take breaks and go up and visit them in the mountains. And one time I went, and my uh, uncle had shot a, a deer, and so we're having a really nice uh, meal with venison steaks. And my aunt, who is a wonderful cook, in addition to the steaks, she's serving it all, and then she goes and brings out the deer heart, the venison heart. She had stuffed it. And she started to slice pieces for everyone to try. The stuffed venison heart. And I can remember I was at the end of the table and the way she sliced it was just like this picture. You could see all four chambers and she's slicing away. And it's one of the few times as I'm watching as my cousins and all everybody's passing the plates around. And I looked at that and all I could think of was to the right ventricle, right into the right atrium, through the valve, to the right ventricle, to the lungs, back to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, to the rest of the deer, and to the right, and to the ventricle, to the lungs, left atrium, left ventricle, rest, and I could just bump them. Bump, bump. And I'm just watching as she continues to slice and I'm just thinking about the blood flow through. By the time it got to me, I finally just said, you know, I'll try those things. But I was just like, you know, I'm, I'll eat the steak. That's fine. The stuffed heart was just a little too much for me. I just finally went, I'm sorry. I know it's probably really good, but I, I just can't. I, I'm going to have to pass on that. So. Um, but next time, like I say, if you're a hunter or next time you're even fixing a turkey or whatever, pull the heart out, slice it, look at it, because you're probably thinking I'm a little too excited about this, but you can see the chordae tendon, you can see the different chambers, you can see the difference in the thickness of the, the myocardium here. You can see the different valves, <coughs> you can see the different vessels. Um, if you have the heart and you're not quite sure, I don't know where this goes, you know, take a, a toothpick or a straw and poke through one of the vessels and see where it comes out. So have fun with it and learn it. We also have some uh, videos 
links to various videos, uh, heart dissections, and one, some of them we did, some of them other people did. Um, but it's kind of cool to see.